John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Um, I'm always happy to be with you guys. I know that uh, you've been carrying uh, yeoman's load with, uh, with doing the shows, but apparently our audience, or at least some of the people in our audience, um, actually like you two just shooting the bull. Somebody thinks that I talk too much and that I don't let Todd say enough. So I should just sit here and shut up. That is an excellent suggestion, at least for a few minutes. Now, uh, you know, we're going to change up a few things here. We're actually going to have a, bit, a little bit of banter. We'll actually talk about some real events. And I'll do some fun things like have a virtual background of Seattle here, flown, taken by my very, very own drone, which I legally flew. At least I think it was legally flown. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff. There's always a lot of stuff happening, always. And sometimes the stuff that happens doesn't escape our notice because we look at the stuff all the time. But they have real issues involved. And at the same time, the average person doesn't hear about it because it's not on the major news. And one we were just talking about before we turned the cameras on, there was actually a collision between an A320 and a fire truck down in Lima, Peru last November killed two firefighters, caught on video live, spectacular and all, but because it didn't happen in a major media market, didn't happen in Western Europe, didn't happen in the US or Canada, it didn't uh, have any uh, traction in the major news media. And there are very real issues that are not unique to South America that have happened here in the States recently when it comes to incursions of vehicles and aircraft. You know, and there's a lot of, a lot of events that occur here in the US uh, because of a lot of different reasons. The, F the NTSB claims they don't have the budget to do a lot of those, but we have ground damage. We have uh, employees killed on the ramp, and uh, oftentimes the NTSB doesn't do any investigation into those at all. And I've long felt that those ki kinds of events, if the NTSB were to do an in-depth investigation like they do in aviation accidents, that some serious improvements could come from them, but they don't go down and they don't look at them. And, you know, just like the maintenance accidents that they do investigate. And when the event comes up and goes into the hangar, they stop right at the hangar doors. And they don't go in and do the same kind of analysis on why the people made the mistake. Why did they skip a step? You know, what kind of pressure was on them to make them do that, if there was any. Uh, there's a whole list, but because they don't go beyond the hangar doors, those issues never come to the surface and never get dealt with. And you mentioned about some of the worker injuries that happened. One of the ones that caught my eye years ago was the fact that when it comes to turbulence injuries, the class of occupant who gets injured more often than not is the flight attendant. And because of the way the NTSB rules are set up, if a turbulence event happens, it's going to be investigated if somebody is killed, but not if somebody is seriously injured. So there's all kinds of turbulence injuries that happen on a, you know, every year, many of them involving flight attendants that don't have the level of investigation that you just mentioned that you would have in a major accident. And again, you don't have to be a genius. If you've been on an airplane, you've seen these flight attendants pushing these 
heavy serving carts. And you say to yourself, I wouldn't want that running over my toe. Well, imagine this thing landing on top of your back. Well, hitting your head. Yeah. Now, there's just a lot of additional things that could, could be improved upon if the NTSB, uh, and I'll take their line, had the budget to go in and, and take a look at those things. But they don't, and the FAA doesn't either. Uh, they record them. You can find them. They're recorded, but that doesn't do much for improvements. And even though there's been a huge increase in the number and scale of videos that are taken by passengers of events that happen, you know, on occasion, rare occasion, this sort of public uh, exposure does lead to some action, but more often than not, it doesn't. And even though these are spectacular things, they're often caught on tape. It takes a whole lot of effort to actually get official action done, not just once, but repeatedly to the point that the risk to the passengers, risk to crew would actually decrease. Yeah. Well, we can't wave a magic wand to make the, the government do anything. So Congress will have to do it. And perhaps our friends in the legal community would, out of the goodness of their hearts, actually uh, have civil actions where money is exchanging hands such that the industry will wake up and say, well, if the government won't have regulatory legal action, we certainly don't want to have shareholder uh, complaints about us losing money because we're not doing the right things in the right way. Now, that's one of the few times you'll see me say positive things about lawsuits actually affecting change. But the sad fact is sometimes it does take that type of action for change to occur. And in our business, uh, that change is usually not going to be instantaneous. It's not going to be one month or one year. It's going to be over a period of years, maybe even decades, before fundamental things change as to how things are done. But we're going to start, stop talking about theoretical things. We're going to talk about something specific, something fun, something interesting. Gentlemen, what do you have? Well, I've got an email that was quite interesting, and it, 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 it's aimed at you, Greg. Uh, one of our viewers wrote in and talked about Eastern Airlines 980 and would like to know more about uh, your adventures up on the glacier. Well, John, that was, uh, it's the highest uh, CFIT accident in aviation history. Uh, the airplane crashed at over 20,000 feet down in the uh, Bolivian Andes Mountains. And Eastern Airlines, that particular accident, uh, occurred January 1st, 1985, which was the start of one of the worst aviation accident years, commercial aviation accident years in history, where uh, we had a lot of major airline hull losses that killed a lot of people. And um, I led an expedition down there 10 months after the accident to uh, try and retrieve both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder and uh, spent a month and a half um, preparing and, and then going down to lead that expedition. And a friend of ours, Peter Camber, who, uh, who's an actor, took an interest in actually this particular accident because it didn't get a lot of media play and it sure didn't get any internet play because it happened in 1985. So there wasn't a lot of exposure, but there were two prominent people on that particular um, airplane at the time. One was the director of the Peace Corps and the other one was the... Uh, uh, the wife of an ambassador. And so uh, one of the things that uh, prompted an investigation, of course, by us, the NTSB, was the fact that the Bolivians did not have an NTSB. They do have a civil aviation authority down there. But they didn't have the wherewithal and the resources to go down and investigate this particular event. So under ICAO Annex 13, they delegated that authority to us here in the United States, one, because it was a flag carrier of ours, Eastern Airlines, and two, because it was a Boeing 727. So we ended up uh, running the investigation in concert with the Bolivians, and a lot of information came out about training and a variety of other things. And a good friend of ours, uh, Peter, is, is doing a two-hour documentary. So I don't want to give away too much because I want to have Peter on the show so that he can talk about the documentary and the things that he has dug up uh, during the course of his research. And of course, you and I, John, did interviews uh, for him about this show. So 
Um, I think the audience would definitely be fascinated with Peter's in-depth study of what got him involved in it and and what he dug up. And he did dig up a lot. Plus, he took uh, he took one of the family members of one of the crew members actually down to Bolivia, and they hiked up part of the mountain um, as they were telling the story. So I think it'll be a very, very interesting show, not only for us, for for flight safety detectives with Peter on it, but then, of course, the documentary. So I'm looking forward to having him on the show and, and you know, all of us talking about this particular event. And you so, mentioned Frank, a few... I want to pick up on, on one thing that you said uh, about Peter pulling up additional information. Most people out there don't realize that the NTSB only digs deep enough to satisfy their needs. And there's a lot of material that's left behind because it, it just doesn't fit uh, where they want to go and what they believe the probable cause is as they develop on. And they oftentimes just don't dig deep enough. They get the, remember, it's the most probable cause. It's never the, it's not the probable cause. It's the most probable cause. So they'll dig it down enough to, to satisfy what they think is the cause and that let it go. And there's so many accidents that I know of, and I know you know even more than I do, where you spend an, an, an investigator, and usually they're ex-NTSB people, will go back and start digging in behind them and come up with all kinds of additional facts. And oftentimes it'll impact on that probable cause. But the NTSB has already made their mind up, and that's where it goes. And frankly, today, with two years from the date the accident happens until that's their, now their target to produce a report two years after the accident, uh, it's stale news. It doesn't have the impact that it needs to have to drive change. It's uh, ho-hum. That happened too long ago. The industry's moved on, and it's lost its effectiveness. And, and you bring up a good point, John, because you and I are currently working an accident where the NTSB did just that. They, uh, they did an investigation. Um, they thought they, or at least in their own mind, they, they believed they collected all the facts, conditions, and circumstances. You and I had an opportunity to examine that same aircraft. We found some stuff that we don't believe they looked at. And when we presented it to them, they basically blew us off and stuck with their original unfounded unsupported probable cause. And we're going to spotlight that particular accident on the show in the near future, because it is critical to flight safety. It is critical to general aviation uh, pilots. So we're going to be talking about that particular accident on this show. And you know, I think both of you have actually addressed indirectly something we were talking about before the show happened, that uh, there are some accidents, including 980, 980 that you mentioned, where Conspiracy theorists, so-called, have opinions about these accidents. And I think both of you just explained in a, in a way that when you see an organization tasked with investigating something, you think they don't go far enough. Why did they quit? Well, there might be, might not be logical reasons or good reasons, but there might be organizational and bureaucratic reasons why they only go so far. And there are some countries which go way further than others. Greg, you mentioned Annex 13. And I'm not going to go into the details, but basically that is the playbook by which nations investigate accidents. And one of the things about the ICAO way of doing business, which is pretty much agreed to by most of the countries on earth, is the country where the event happens is in charge of the investigation unless, let's say in your case with uh, 980, the country allows a second country to take it over. So if you have something that happens to happen in a place that has lots of press coverage, uh, a Freedom of Information Act, an active media, and questioning people who will just stay on it for years and years, you'll get a lot of information. If it happens in a smaller country with a small aviation community, an aviation organization, and no resources to check it out, it may languish. And it's not a conspiracy. It's unfortunately the way, uh, the way it is when it comes to the differing levels of intensity you see when it comes to an investigation. Absolutely. Most people don't know or don't realize how expensive these investigations are. You know, they think it's uh, just going out there and, and kicking tin until you find a problem. But those investigations, the more complex they are, 
the numbers mount up real quick. In, in TWA 800, which was one of the biggest investigations that the NTSB has done, uh, there was over $50 million spent on that. Uh, that's a lot of money. The airplane wasn't even worth that much money. But they dug into the facts because there were so many of those airplanes flying and it defied all kinds of descriptions to figure out what really happened. So it took a lot of work. And uh, the other one was the 737 in Pittsburgh. It took four years to solve. Uh, and that cost a lot of money as well because it was something nobody has ever seen before with these modern ways of uh, building airplanes and modern systems that, that uh, use control mechanisms that we've never seen before. In fact, uh, I'll never forget that uh, many of us in, that were involved with that accident investigation said that the only person in the world that understood how that rudder peak uh, power control unit worked was the guy who designed it because it got, once you started down into how it operated, it got very, very con convoluted. It, uh, it really was a very complicated system. So it's, uh, it's not an easy assignment to dig through all those wreckages and come up with a probable cause. Uh, sometimes they do a great job and sometimes, you know, things are left on the table. You mentioned Flight 800 in 1996. Not only did you have the NTSB putting the resources on there and the, the manufacturer where I was working at the time, you also had the U.S. Armed Forces, primarily the Navy, spending all kinds of money investigating that. And that's not something that's going to be accounted for in one little spreadsheet somewhere. There were budgets all over that were being thrown at that problem. So at the end of the day, it was probably well over $50 million in 1996 dollars. Yeah, I no doubt we didn't. The, the Navy money that the Navy spent, and it was considerable, is not in that number. And the, number, the amount of money that the FBI spent uh, determining whether or not it was a terrorist act is not in that number either. There was, there was a lot of money spent on that accident, a lot of money. Not to mention the what, how many decades was there a warehouse, uh, a hangar dedicated to the reconstituted wreckage of that? So there was money being spent decades after this event. It's still there right now today. The NTSB is trying to uh, break it down and get rid of it, but it's on hold right now. And, uh, and so here we are in, in 2023, so that's 26 years ago when we're still paying to store the wreckage and and uh, learn from it. And there's a lot to learn from that airplane. This is years after the airline that flew it went out of business. This is a few months after that aircraft model is no longer in production. This is years after, at least in my case, when I was at Boeing, most of the people I worked around who were involved in that event in one form or another are no longer with the company. And, uh, and yet it's still out there and uh, we're still trying to learn from it. And uh, again, there's the cost, there's the difficulty, there's the, fortunately, the insights that come over time that allow us sometimes to go back and look at old data in completely new ways. This will be an ongoing thing, as it is with 980, as it is with Flight 800, as it is with MH370, our favorite uh, event of the last uh, nine years. Yeah, boy, I wish we could find that one. Well, like I keep telling everybody, I, well, one of these days, we one won't of these days, I'm sorry, go ahead. I talk too much, sorry. What? <laughs> there, will be, there will be a day when the wreckage will be found. And I can almost guarantee you that anyone listening to this broadcast in the year 2023 will not be alive when that happens. Hmm. Yeah, well, and if you watch the Netflix special about it, um, it's probably five minutes of fact and hour and a half worth of fiction, but it, that's a story for another day. Yeah, I agree. Well, we wanted to talk about some of the, the uh, injuries and problems on the ramp, not just maintenance problems, but, but all the other employees. That was a conversation we had just before we started this recording about uh, a number of people that have been killed on the ramp and some with NTSB investigations, some without. And I, I know a couple that, uh, that I know that happened that the NTSB didn't investigate, but we know, I know that there was one in Washington, D.C., where a baggage handler 
who had been off on an injury and back with some residual painkillers in his system actually ended up getting uh, mesmerized, if you will, and walked into a propeller that was still turning and hit him in the head and, and uh, killed him. And we've recently had another young lady down in uh, down south someplace. I forgotten where. And uh, the airplane had just come in and she did the same thing, a similar thing, and uh, lost track of where she was and ended up uh, walking into a turning engine. And then, Greg, you and I worked on a really horrific one down in uh, Texas uh, 20 years ago, maybe not quite that many, uh, that uh, a mechanic was killed over his hat. So why don't we talk about those a little bit? So you're going to have to open your mouth now. <laughs> well, the one down in El Paso that you and I worked, 737 sitting at the gate, uh, first officer had done a walk around and noticed that there was uh, oil spotting under one of the engines. So uh, called company. Company said, yeah, you got to get contract maintenance out there. So they ended up using uh, contract maintenance, which took a little while for them to respond. And there is a prescribed procedure that you can talk about, John, um, with regard to identifying how serious the uh, the oil leak is and and what constitutes whether the airplane goes and flies or stays on the ground. So they send several people over from the contract maintenance um, organization, including one of uh, one of the maintenance guys who's an older gentleman, ex Air Force guy. And you know, and you can explain it, John, that anybody that works around or uh, on the ramp, whether it's a mechanic or uh, a ramp person, you know, baggage person or anybody else, um, you don't want to have things that are loose on your body, whether it's clothing, like a hat or any kind of, uh, you know, things in your pockets that could come out because it creates FOD and, and that kind of thing on the ramp. And these mechanics show up, they open the engine cowling, and there is a prescribed procedure that I'll let you discuss. But uh, in trying to perform this particular procedure, um, this older mechanic, who should have known better because of his background, because of his years of experience, is wearing a hat. And when you talk about the positioning of where this mechanic was, John, people will understand how this uh, mechanic lost his life uh, very tragically in this particular event. All right, so you have an engine that look appears to be leaking oil. You got a pud puddle of oil underneath the engine. So the, the flight crew calls their company, the company calls the, the contract maintenance company and they come over and they open the cowling on the engine and the cowling on the engine opens up like gull wings on either side just opens right up. So they're looking around in, the, in typical fashion. The oil is spread all over the engine. You can't really tell where it's coming from, but you can see that it was a pretty good leak. And now you have to try to figure out where the leak is coming from. So they uh, have the crew start the engine. Now, in an airplane like this, in an airport like this, uh, there's no jetway. They have stairs. And the customer service people, they want to get the airplane loaded up and get it out of there. And they're hoping maintenance can fix the problem while they're loading the airplane. So now maintenance needs to have the engine run so that they can try to determine where the oil's leaking from. I'm assuming that they probably went through with, with the rags and wiped all, everything down from fittings and all so that it was clean so they could get a, a good look of, of where it possibly could be leaking from. And they have the engine started and they were unable to determine where it was. Now the oil pressure on engine starts pretty low. So they asked the crew to, to uh, raise the, essentially the RPM of the engine. And now everybody knows today's engines are pretty large in the front end. They, uh, and that CFM that's on the 737, we used to call it a vacuum cleaner because when it went across the ramp, because they're so low, it would suck up everything off the ramp. It would clean the ramp, nuts and bolts and everything. So we would, we would uh, oftentimes find fan blades damaged 
because of debris that it would pick up from the from the runways. And that led to a major campaign across the whole country to keep the ramps clean because of that engine. But anyway, we have an engine that's big. Now it's running at higher than normal RPM. It's sucking in a lot of air in the front end. And on that cowling that came up, you would think that when you get to the front of the cowling, the front piece of the cowling, that's where you have to be concerned with. But on that particular engine, the concern area goes back aft of the front of the engine. And there's actually a warning line all the way around the cowling on the engine They're telling you to not walk forward of that line because the air is, it's so hungry for air, it's sucking it around wherever it can get, including from be beside the engine back up into the front. So this particular mechanic was working in that area and his hat came loose. And he ran up a lean forward to get his hack so it wouldn't go into the engine. And meanwhile, with his clothes acting as a big sail, he sucked around, pulled right up and around and back into the engine. And it and he perished because of it. And that that was a real tragedy because it didn't need to happen over a hat. But, but I've seen I've seen similar events. I, I, here in Boston, we had a guy on the headset talking to the crew, and they started the engine because they needed additional pneumatic power to start the opposite side engine, and they put the power up, and it took the headset off his head with his hat and emptied his shirt pocket. Well, you know what? That happened. That's an engine change. Yeah. All that metal went into the front end. It's all over. It's an engine change. And, and Todd and I were looking at an event. Uh, involving, uh, and it, again, it was at a smaller airport, but uh, a jet powered aircraft. And there was a uh, ramp person out there that had, and this is January, this is actually uh, around New Year's Eve. And had they, this particular uh, operation had multiple safety briefings and warned this particular gentleman about walking around and operating, doing their respective job around the front end of these engines and and a lot of a lot of the airlines and a lot of the uh the ramp um folks that work out there uh, with third-party contract maintenance or not maintenance but just third-party uh contractors you know have established procedures you don't go within 15 20 feet of the front end of the engine um we know that if you look out the window you know and you're standing in the passenger terminal and you see engine or airplanes come in, you can see what looks like a pig's tail or curly cue on the uh, on the spinner of those engines. Well, that's there for a reason. It's not to mesmerize you or hypnotize you. It is to actually show that that engine is in operation in some way, shape, or form. And you have to pay attention to that. Well, this guy walked multiple times in front of an operating engine, and the last time um, was his final time because he too got sucked into the engine and it was a very unfortunate accident and he had been warned. And we've seen this over and over and over again, general aviation ramps, where you have people that are walking uh, across a ramp to go to a general aviation airplane. You got to look and listen. You have to understand that, you know, that blade, it's a guillotine. You walk into that, that spinning blade, you're not coming out as a whole person. Um, there was a, a very well-known uh, young lady uh, I think she was a model at one point or was a model at the time. Uh, she had gone for a ride in a, uh, I think it was a decathlon, got out of the airplane and walked towards the front of the airplane and actually got struck by the prop. She survived, but, you know, uh, her face was damaged and a variety of other things. It is all about ramp safety, no matter whether you're an employee or someone walking around at a general aviation airport going out to go fly with your friends or whatever. It is all about situational awareness and what is going on. And a lot of these events take place at night. Why? Because propellers don't have lights on them. You hear an engine running, uh, but uh, you know, like the daytime, those propellers are invisible. And you just have to assume that if there's a noise, that prop is turning. And, and you know, on a big airport, there's always noise. So that gets to be a bigger problem. Yeah. You, you know, you just can't go by noise. Sometimes you, you're able to see the rotating beacon that's red flashing light on the top of the fuselage and on the bottom of the fuselage. But there's so many of those around, 
and so much equipment with the red lights on it that uh, you lose track of it. You get immune to all of it. And it, it reads, needs to be constantly reinforced by, uh, by the crews. And some of the airlines have done that. In fact, one of my students at Vaughn, uh, his job is to do just that. He's like a safety monitor for the ramp crew. And he's out there making sure that they don't drive equipment up to the airplane, uh, you know, not rushing to get in if the engine's running, uh, making sure they have guide people around because I'm sure many of our audience, but maybe not all, knows that uh, in a typical year, there's about 15 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars worth of damage caused to airplanes by ground equipment and jetways. Hmm. Yeah. Right. The and Tom and, I, and uh, yeah. some of the airlines have really gone to very strict rules about movements around their airplanes uh, to protect from that damage. And I hope by, a byproduct of that is also protecting the people going around uh, that are, have to work in and around the airplanes. Yeah. Well, Todd and I had a discussion before uh, we started recording, and that was you know, the things that happen in the cockpit, we always talk about situational awareness, we talk about fatigue, we talk about complacency, distraction, we talk about all those things. And of course, we've talked about it in the same vein, happening in the maintenance hangar. But it also happens on the ramp. You can have the complacency, you can have the distraction, you can have the fatigue, you can have, a variety, you know, not really understanding your situational awareness. And, you know, Todd and uh, I mean, we're all flying all the time and Todd and I are flying little airplanes all the time. There's not a day that I don't walk out on the ramp and I know I hear one or more engines. I stop, look and listen because I want to know if that engine is running anywhere where I'm going to be walking. Another thing to consider, even if you're at a small airport, there are all kinds of people on the ramp. They may not be from the same organization. Heck, you may not have ever, ever met them before. Guy comes out to fuel my aircraft. I mean, he's a nice guy and all that, and I'm sure the company is a great company, but I might have never met this person before. So I just can't assume that they know all the nuances and ins and outs of how, how to do things and how not to do things. And I can't assume that I know how to behave around someone who's doing some service on the aircraft. So again, if you're one of these people who's on the ramp and you're confused by what might be going around, around you, you know, I'm not surprised because uh, I'm constantly confused when I'm on the ramp because I don't know everything about what's going on behind around me. Although, like you said, Greg, I'm paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he working on the ramp. Oh, but absolutely. Yeah. I wish we had. I wish we had better investigations. You know, the FAA and the and uh, OSHA have long had a dispute over whose jurisdiction. Uh, the ramp is, and it's the FAA's jurisdiction. And for the longest time, the FAA wouldn't let anybody from OSHA do any investigations. And uh, that's sort of broken down now. OSHA does some, but they they don't do every one. And they need to. Somebody needs to to put all these issues on the table, even if you don't get solutions. But make sure that the, all the facts and circumstances are captured, so that some point in the future, if any one of these agencies decides they need to do an in-depth look, they can have all the facts and circumstances from multiple previously uh, occurring events and maybe make some improvements. Bingo. Dave, one of our uh, listeners said that not only do I talk too much, but I use facts, conditions, and circumstances, and I should have a bingo game. So you started it, John, with facts and conditions. So <laughs> I finished it. So bingo. <laughs> so well I, I think that you know like anything else in aviation it is all about being plugged in being present both mentally and physically but more mentally understanding your environment and and we harp that all the time and john you close our sh uh, our show with it all the time about being present and of course doing a thorough and methodical pre-flight. So with that being said, since again, I talk too much, Todd, I'm gonna let you have the second to the last word. Well, as we uh, demonstrated today, not everything about safety is about people who get hurt or planes that crash, although 
Uh, it's a large part of what we do. And what is the reality of aviation? And not everything is investigated by the formal authorities that are out there. So there are safety issues. Sometimes there, there, there's information that's given to you as a professional working on the ramp or whatnot. Sometimes it's not. In any case, if you think it might be a potential danger to you and the people around you, act accordingly. Yeah, pay attention is what it really amounts to. I see, you know, I just, just today I was in an FBO watching the people on the ramp, business aircraft on the ramp, and it's still, it's still the same problem, you know, out at the last minute. In fact, one airplane, uh, it had come out of the hangar, it was sitting there, and the amount of time that the crew spent on the airplane, I doubt that they did a very thorough pre-flight. They probably did it while they were taxiing on the way out, um, but it, you know, you can't short circuit any of this stuff. If you're gonna go flying, you need to do a good session of pre-planning. Even before you get to the airport, start thinking about what you're doing, start looking at events, make sure you're checking the weather, right? Your fuel load, right? make sure that the, the fuel cap's on. Just recently saw an airplane uh, leave with the fuel cap off. And it was only a short flight, but, you know, there he goes. And the fuel cap uh, damaged a very expensive paint job, so he, he probably had some uh, explaining to do. But you got to do a very good pre-flight. And after you get in the airplane and, and uh, get off the ground, you better be putting your head on the swivel because the skies today and many, many of these airports are full of airplanes with very inexperienced people in them. In fact, I, we have one that I pulled out for a future show uh, where a, a, a CFI and a student got too close to a jet in front of them and almost lost the airplane. And uh, that was just recently in the news. So uh, we'll be talking about that soon. But you've got to pay attention to where you are. Good free flight, good walk around. And you get off the ground, put that head on a swivel to make sure that you're not going to have somebody else's accident. I, uh, somebody, one of my instructors a long time ago told me, you know, if you're going to have an accident, have your own accident. Don't get involved with somebody else's accident. And, uh, you know, how do you do that? By paying attention to what you're doing and what's going on around you. So with that, please, please fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that. And we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.